Farming Britain serves up Wimbledon with a spin. We're starting with the nation's summer favourite, strawberries. We meet the growers and find out what makes the grade and what makes the jam. It's a shame, but at least it will go somewhere on the London wholesale markets and uh, someone again will enjoy them over the weekend. Then, of course, it's the cream and we're going raw. We meet the dairy farmer fighting to keep his dairy products on the shelf. Our brand could go like that because somebody hasn't done their job properly in here. We have news and farming YouTube. Welcome to Farming Britain. Growing strawberries is a competitive, dynamic business. Millions are invested in keeping this most delicate of fruits looking and tasting great. Storage, transport, and now even robots. It's all driven by our love of this beautiful berry, and because in the UK we eat with our eyes, the consumer demands perfection. It's 22 mil. 22 mil around there is the spec. I would say 25 grams in weight. Colour, flavour, size and shape are all critical and it's the job of the growers to make sure that happens every day of the growing season. Devon is going to show us what so won't make the grade. So if you have a look here, yeah, we do have some issue of green tips. It's influenced by fluctuation in hot and cold temperatures. This doesn't reach spec in the markets. Uh, there is some tolerance to it, but not much. We are looking to try and create the perfect berry that goes on the shelf. We can put one of these berries into a punnet, depending on what the, the market's allowing us to put in. That looks absolutely delicious to me, but I imagine maybe it's too big for the market? Yeah, so majority of strawberries go either into a 400 or a 600 gram punnet. We do go up to a kilo, um, but yes, you can imagine having a 400 gram punnet with maybe four berries in, it's not gonna look that good. So a British consumer then, Devon, how many sort of varieties might they pick up in a season from a, from a British supermarket? In the UK, I would say roughly around 20 to 25 different varieties. Devon grows four or five different strawberry varieties to help deliver an uninterrupted supply through the season. The way they're propagated, the size of the plant, daylight, temperature, wind, pests, all have a bearing on when the berry is ready for picking. And that's the start of a highly managed journey. So a lot of people talk of snap picking. So if you have a variety that's very firm and, and, and doesn't bruise easily and so forth, you can basically just pull on the berry and, and, and it will come off, but it won't have a stalk. Um, and then what we're doing, if you have a softer variety, we'll, do, uh, we'll basically pinch and twist, and then you'll have your stalk on the top. So it gives it a nice look of a berry but it also, you won't be handling the, the berry and causing finger bruises, and then that will go straight into the punnet so you're not physically touching the berry. The next step is all about temperature control and TLC. Lee is Mansfield's CEO, and he's been in fruit, man and boy, and loves it. If you weren't growing fruit, what would you do? Oh, I don't, don't know, I've been doing this since I was 14, so, uh, I don't think I can imagine myself doing anything else, to be honest. You know, when you see the fruit start from nothing and then grow all the way through to being on the customer's table, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic feeling. We're in Mansfield's pack house and chillers. The fruit might be over 25 degrees plus in the field, but Mansfield's want them at three degrees ASAP. From the field, the strawberries have come straight back here, chilled at four degrees. They'll unload into a chill, this chill chamber, then they'll go straight into the pack house. You'll see, you see the packing process, back out ready for dispatch, all within chill process. So when it goes out of here, they'll all be, at, all be around about two, three degrees. So keeping that chill chain is absolutely uh, imperative for quality. That's when PMLC Frigo becomes part of the chain linking grower with retailer. Efficiency is key and it comes at a price. The pickers now are doing a light selection just to make sure the weight is correct and then it's going to go through the DC2, through our check values and metal detectors 
before getting a deal put onto it. So this cherry and soft fruit stone pack house that you see here, across the whole of the site with our grader, uh, you're looking at around about 15 million pounds worth of investment. And you know, they're short seasons as well, so it is all about efficiencies, it's about quality, because quality drives repeat sales, and that's what we're trying to do as a business. Uh, pick it right, pick it once, and then pack it through the system. So what happens to all that beautiful fruit that's just not beautiful enough? Well, it looks like they'll find a good home. This is market fruit in these pallets. Nothing wrong with it, it's only driven by size, uh, but the quality is fantastic. Uh, it's a shame, but at least it will go somewhere on the London wholesale markets and uh, someone again will join them over the weekend. We are a cosmetic society in the UK. You know, if you was in Europe now, all of these would be picked up alongside anything else as a glass one. Uh, but, you know, we have to do what, you know, the customers want. That's what we're here for. We leave Mansfields with asking Lee what message does he want to send to the British consumer. It's not just about what we grow, it's about the environment, it's about the sustainability, it's about children's health. You know, fruit is a valuable part of our everyday diet and, you know, just support British. You can't say fairer than that. Thank you to Lee, Devon and PML Frigo for supporting this show. The farmers produce the food and those guys make sure it arrives in tip-top condition. Next up, it's me again with the news. This is Farming Britain News. Neil Parrish, the former Conservative MP and chair of the EFRA committee, which held DEFRA to account in Westminster, has come out in favour of the Lib Dems' agricultural policies. Well, one bit of the Lib Dem um, agricultural policy I like is actually support for farming and support for food production. Uh, and I just don't think any of the political parties talk enough about it, the Tories included. All of the main political parties mention agriculture in their manifestos. The National Farmers Union says that there are plenty of positives across the three main party manifestos. And it too points to the Lib Dem and Conservative commitments to increase the UK agricultural budget by £1 billion and protect it. The NFU calls Labour's manifesto claim that the badger cull has been ineffective, incredibly unhelpful. The farmers' pressure group Enough is Enough lit bonfires on farms around Wales to highlight the importance of agriculture before the general election. Sarah Atherton, Conservative MP for Wrexham in North Wales, until the run-up to the election says that Labour's record on agriculture in Wales is telling. So the Welsh Labour government here in Wales have introduced some quite radical uh, farming policies which our farmers are certainly not happy with and I'm with them on that. So whichever government is in place uh, on the 5th of July, there needs to be a very serious, grown-up, pragmatic and practical debate and discussion and raising awareness of the issues that affect rural farming uh, communities. Staying with Neil Parrish and he is affected by a new Westminster government plan for a new level of rewilding in North Somerset. DEFRA rules that nuclear power station Hinkley Point, currently under reconstruction, will kill 800 acres of fish when it opens. It wants owner EDF to offset that by flooding 800 acres of farmland with seawater. It wants EDF to re-sea the land. Among those most angry with the proposal for the Paulette Hams are local farmers Phil Gooding and his neighbour, farmer and former MP, Neil Parrish they stand to lose much of their land to the sea. What we're looking at is the Pool at Hams, a great area of both grazing land and, and use for arable, um, and of course full of, of livestock, um, and traditionally some of the best grazing land in the country. Um, and for us, taking it away and creating a salt marsh, which will not enhance the fish population, will just be an absolute nonsense. It's a, it's a greenwashing, it's ticking of boxes, it's political correctness at its worst. There's a link to our film about the scandal below. The boom in solar farms has replaced agriculture, which could have fed millions of people. That's the conclusion of a report in New Scientist magazine. The report from a Chinese university says that even in 2018, more than 1,300 square kilometres of cropland worldwide was covered by solar panels, an area that could have been producing four quadrillion calories per year. The froth is coming off the Scottish land market. 
Land prices overheated by vast tree planting grants from the government and now cooling according to a new report by the Scottish Land Commission. Meanwhile, the same conservation bodies that persuaded the Scottish Government to put those grants in place are beginning to doubt their effectiveness. They now say it might have been better to let habitats regenerate naturally. Meanwhile, another study finds a tree planting scheme that was hit with celebs during the 1980s and 1990s actually made climate change worse. Terry Wogan, Phil Collins and Cliff Richards are among those who used the scheme as a tax break. Now scientists say that planting on ancient peat bogs releases huge amounts of greenhouse gases. And finally, dairy farmers in Denmark are facing a new cow tax. They're expected to pay around £75 per cow per year due to the planet heating emissions the Danish government says they generate. It's the world's first carbon emissions tax on agriculture. The move has angered some farmers. The country's coalition government agreed on the tax with levies on livestock due to start in 2030. You are now to date with Farming Britain News. Next up, raw dairy. It divides opinion. So we've been along to a dairy farmer in Sussex to find out what the fuss is about. Dairy farmer Steve Hook says the only similarity between pasteurised and unpasteurised milk is that they're both whitish and they're both called milk. Liquid ice cream. Hook & Son has been producing raw milk for nearly 20 years, and it's not been easy. Our brand could go like that because somebody hasn't done their job properly in here. Public unease over the safety of raw milk products, a high-profile battle to stop his most productive pasture being built on, and of course the threat of TB stopping him in his tracks, means he's a fighter, but a spotlessly clean one. He has to be. There's risk with any food. It just seems that with raw milk, there isn't any allowance of risk by the food industry. His dairy was built in 1973, and it takes two hours to milk his small herd. He went into raw dairy as he had control. He could sell it direct. It was something different and cherished in other cultures. The milk is pumped into that tank that holds 200 litres. It was the positive response he got from customers in the London markets that convinced him he was onto something. Every time somebody bought it, I would ask them why they bought it, and they would tell me the reason why it was important to them. And really, it was the cultures from around the world that haven't got strong pasteurising industries. The more westernised countries are, the more milk knowledge has been laid to waste and forgotten. It's so lovely to sell a product that we work so hard on the farm here to produce. It's so lovely almost to be armed with this amazing food that we produce and, and, and go out and, and, and sell it because I just feel there's nothing that can, can be found out about raw milk that's going to upset me. The more I find out about it, the more I'm glad that I've got raw milk on my side. Coincidentally, today Steve is also being filmed by a student from northern India who was raised with house cows and raw milk and the cultural importance of things like ghee, a type of clarified butter with loads of benefits. It gives you long-lasting energy, a small amount of it. Mm -hmm. You can have it and you can have with your food and then the energy through provided by it lasts long. That's yeah, that's true. Because yeah. the farmers yeah. in our, how, like people, they, that's the only thing they, and they use a lot in their vegetables and all. Yeah. Like what happens is uh, just once they prepare their food, and when they're going to eat it, they put a spoonful of ghee into mm -hmm. on directly onto their yeah. veggie. Yeah. And then they have it more than yeah. that. And then yeah. it like sustains them throughout the day. Right. But it is a staple food. You have to have it in my house. If I say I don't want to have ghee with my veg, I'll be having fight with my mother that day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. that thing. Oh my God, it's that important. Yeah. yeah. I have a lot of people that um, have bullet coffees with ghee. So instead of putting milk or cream in with their coffee, they put ghee in as, as a power coffee. Now as it's Wimbledon fortnight, let's talk cream. Whole milk with cream, lots of it. Obviously this is raw milk and this is full fat milk. Now full fat milk comes out of a cow at about 4.1%. But for full fat to be sold in the shops, by law, it can be as low as 3.5%. So the dairies take off a bit of fat and still they're still able to to call the milk full fat milk at 3.5%. But this is 4.1%. 
and this is unhomogenized so the cream will settle out and in raw milk it settles really really well now you can see the cream line there this is you've got that much as cream that is skim milk in effect and that's where the cream line should be and that bit of cream is so worth running down the stairs for first in the morning to have on your cereals that's the best cream you can have and because it's raw the cholesterol in that is in its natural form which means your good blood cholesterol goes up and your bad goes down so not only you've got lovely cream which is to die for it's good for you at the same time how about that <laughs> uh, and where can I get this from? This product, this super product. Oh yeah, uh, Hook and Son. Hook and Son. <laughs> no, with unbranded bottle. With the unbranded bottle. You did so well. Uh, with no branding. I know. We're, that's another story. I've had to go unbranded bottles for the moment. So we're winding down our branded bottles because they've got the word organic on. And our, whilst the farmer's license is organic, the milk that we sell in a bottle can't be called organic because we put it into a bottle. So that's a disco. What? Yeah. You put it into a bottle? Yeah. And that then removes the organic? Uh, well, I could call it organic if I have an organic processor's license, which is another cost again. So my cows are organic, the farm's organic, and my cows produce organic milk. But because I've put it into a bottle, that requires an organic processor's license on top of, process, uh, on top of the producer's license as the farm. So. Uh, so if I was suckling straight from the cow, no problem at all? No problem at all. That would be organic milk that you're having. <laughs> but because I've got, put it into a bottle, it can no longer be called organic. I think that's another story, Steve. It is. Time to see the cows before they're brought in for milking. They're grazing on the Pevensey Marshes, a wildlife haven with a rich tapestry of grasses and herbs for the cattle to graze on. And my cows down on this land have got freedom which is quality of life, it's choices, they can choose what they eat and they can self-medicate as well, they can eat out of the hedges, the different flora and it's fascinating watching a cow, what she eats, it's quite surprising and that makes my cows very gentle, very happy, um, the policy on the farm is no raised voices, no raised arms, so they're very good with people but coming back to the marsh you can see how tranquil, how peaceful it is. It's not just good for my well-being. <laughs> I believe it's good for my cow's well-being as well. Good girls, push up, one more. Go on, up you get. Go on, push up, push up. Well done. Time for milking and Steve and Jasmine have a very strict workflow. All right, girl, all right. All right, good girl. I put on a foam. The foam does three things. It sort of starts to break down muck. It is a sanitizer and it also acts as a skin conditioner so that it stops teats from cracking. You don't want cracked teats because that's somewhere else that bacteria can harbor. Um, good girl. So I'm just stripping out the four milk. The milk is a good color. It's not watery or bloody. Then clean the teats with a paper towel. Nothing really there. Then white, sanitizing wet white. Do it again. Inspect it, that's, that's pretty clean. This milk is effectively going straight from the teat into somebody's glass to drink. So I've got to have confidence that that person can drink my milk absolutely safely and enjoy the, obviously enjoy the product. And this is the most important point in producing that litre of milk, is right now, putting the, the unit onto the teat. If I get that wrong, or if my staff gets that wrong, and we have some, say, food poisoning as a result, that's 15 years of work creating our brand, getting to where we are today, 15 years gone, down the pan. So this, is so important this stage, which is why it's great seeing young people like Jasmine learn, learning these skills and and taking ownership of this job. It's, 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 it's really great. What's the best trait? Definitely the cows. <laughs> Definitely. They're the best. There is so much more to raw milk, so there'll be a podcast with Steve coming out in the next few weeks. In the meantime, 
have a look at the Hook & Son website or catch up with them at one of the many London markets. Thank you, Steve. Next up, it's Farming YouTube with A Taste of Wimbledon with James Marchington. This is Farming YouTube, which aims to show the latest and best farming videos that YouTube has to offer. This time, with all eyes on Wimbledon, here's a selection with a bit of a tennis theme. First, the story of American Mark Kuhn, who was such a fan of Wimbledon that he created a replica of Center Court on his farm in Iowa. It's now become a tennis club that aims to offer visitors the ultimate Wimbledon experience. It wouldn't be Wimbledon without strawberries. And here's a short film featuring the Kent farm that's been supplying the championships for more than 30 years. What goes with strawberries? Cream of course, these lovely Irish ladies definitely won't be supplying Wimbledon, but it is a fascinating look at how cream was separated by hand in a traditional Irish farmhouse. If you need to work on your forehand, how about a spot of thistle bashing? The funky farmer is out with his boys slashing down bull thistles that have grown up in the cattle pasture. It looks like an accident waiting to happen, and it very nearly does. With a bit of farmer's ingenuity, tennis balls have a lot more uses than just bashing them around a court. This grower invented a system for using them to collect cash at his roadside fruit and veg stall. On this farm in Michigan, a few tennis balls and some rope ease the job of pulling plastic over the growing tunnels. Tennis balls have their dangers too though. Vet Sean McPeck explains that letting your dog play with tennis balls can result in a condition called tennis ball mouth, leading to some expensive dental work. Finally, after all that tennis, you're going to need a nice cold glass of Pims. And did you know that drink was invented in the 1830s by a farmer's son, James Pym? This film shows how to make a litre and a half of the perfect classic Pims and lemonade with all the trimmings. That's it for this episode. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into our next roundup, email us the link hello at farmingbreton.tv. Thank you for watching our Wimbledon inspired Farming Britain. Please subscribe to the channel and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We'll see you next time.